Hello there, sword friends. Today I'm going to tell you about this sword right here. It is the Doomsday Katana from Scorpion Swords. And before I get into the review, some quick disclaimers. One, this is a review sample from Sword Friend Vance. It was sent to me to review and destroy for your benefit, so hopefully you enjoy it. And special thanks to Sword Friend Vance for sending it my way. Uh, but do know I didn't spend any money on it, so if you think that makes me biased, you know at the start. And also know that I don't use this kind of sword particularly often. I talk about swords, I talk about them a lot, in fact, but I don't fancy myself an expert on this kind of wide substantial fantasy kind of sword. I, I study swordsmanship, but anyway, what I'm trying to get at is that I fancy myself a novice on the subject. Uh, the other bit that you should note is that this sword is 300-ish dollars. I think it was 275 or 300 when it was sold. It's the original Doomsday Katana, and it's sold as like a fantasy, cool, substantial, indestructible, durable kind of thing, but they're not sold as historical replicas. They're not sold as traditionally made, and I don't think they're surprising anyone with what they're getting. Uh, but the purpose of this video is is to elaborate on just that. Uh, what was it sold as? How did it deliver on its promise? You'll see me talk about the build quality, the fit and finish, and then I'll do some cutting with it, and eventually I will push it to failure, and you'll get to see that. At the end, I'll give you my thoughts, but hopefully by that time you had enough of me and can make up your own mind about it. Anyway, on with the show. So first I'm going to go over what are they trying to sell, and nearest I can tell, the Scorpion Swords Doomsday line of katanas, or Doomsday line of swords, is intended to be a really substantial, imposing looking sword that's very, very durable and overbuilt to compensate for it. I don't think anyone is surprised by that, or anyone is expecting a light dueling sword or a historically accurate reproduced sword. I'm pretty sure they're on the nose about what they're trying to sell. Now, the, the swords themselves don't have a lot of profile and dimension, they're relatively simple in, in construction, and this one will have measurements and all the kind of stuff in the description down below if you're keen on. So typically I start these reviews at the kasha, the palm of the end cap, and kind of work my way down the blade, soup to nuts, top to bottom. And I can't really do that here because there isn't such a thing. There is a through tang with scales that are, are pegged on. Now where the end cap would be, there is some dimension here. It flares out just a little bit, it swells out, and it does do something uh, to kind of keep your grip there and let you feel that you're coming towards the end. And there is some additional carving where the uh, the pommel or the kashara might be on a katana. It points out a little bit. It wouldn't be fun to get thumped in the head with it. And it's also worth noting that I was very aggressive with this handle and the scales are still still on it. Now, uh, where the peg is down here, there was a little space, a little imperfection in manufacture that was there before I started. Uh, but overall, I would say that the woodworking on here was reasonably smooth for a sword and the price point. Woodworking can be tough to do. Often I see lots of resin and residue and stuff like that all over the place. I don't see that here. I don't see a lot of signs of excess glue and goopy messes and stuff like that. The carving on it is overall relatively simple on this end bit here. The swell is pretty simple, but it's ergonomic and uh, does the job. There's no hot spots or anything that bites into my hands, uh, but it is worth noting that as I travel up the grip, it is pretty meaty feeling. It's a pretty substantial sized grip, and that might not be for everyone. My hands fit around it, but um, I have a big sausage fingers, and I, I would say that people with smaller grips might not find this particularly comfortable as it is uh, a little bit more tool-esque as opposed to sword-esque. Anyway, as you move down the grip, you have wood scales on here. They have held up pretty well. There's a slight crack and they split away from the blade when I was really aggressive and throwing it at a tree and bending it. Uh, but otherwise they've, they've held up and they're still on after all the abuse that I threw at the sword, which is saying something. Also worth noting that the scales were bound the, the tang really quite well. Oftentimes I see on swords much more expensive than this that there are gaps and they didn't grind them flat and they didn't secure them well with glue and there's gaps and schmutz and epoxy and stuff everywhere. I don't see that here. They seem placed on pretty well and smoothed up uh, overall reasonably well. Now the, the size of the handle is where I might take a little bit of issue. It is chongasy and big and it's not slippery. The woodwork is good and there's no hot spots on it. It doesn't bite my hand. Uh, at least it didn't anywhere until I again started being pretty aggressive. One of the pegs started moving out, which has created a hot spot. It's a little bit sharp there, um, but it's it's just really big and it doesn't have a lot of taper this way. So you're it's pretty much flat on one end here and just chunky, <laughs> chunky. If you have small hands, this might be uh, tougher to get, to get a hold of or not as comfortable. The other bit I want to note about the grip is while well, it's held up well, there was a reasonable amount of shock when I was using this in two hands. If I really leaned into something, hit a tree, a brick, a metal pole, which you'll see me do later, I did feel a good amount of vibration in my lower hand. Uh, this gave a pretty good bit of shock, shock, and it was a lot more comfortable to swing one-handed hard than it was to swing two-handed hard, hard when I impacted a target that shot, basically stopped the sword and all that shock traveled down into my hand and I could feel it. It wasn't particularly comfortable. 
Um, other bits about the about the grip is I do see little knots and whatnot in here. Uh, none of those broke or split. It split, you know, one place, but not in where a knot was. And it was finished on the kind of the top area where it meets the blade reasonably well. It doesn't have as much dimension as I was li would like. And there are three pegs which proved to be uh, sufficient, but one of them did start to pop out the top one a little bit and created a little bit of a hot spot. But that isn't really where I found myself grabbing grabbing the blade very often. Now the long grip does provide some versatility in grip until you really start swinging. And then, as I noted. There was a little bit of shock that would come through so if you're cutting through your targets two hands is nice if you're cutting softer targets but if you're getting a lot of resistance or shock then then that second hand is going to feel it a lot more and you really kind of because of the size uh, you i don't hold it loosely i really have to kind of white knuckle it to feel like i'm in control because it's so big it wants to break my grip a little bit it indexes easily enough but uh, if I don't hold it tight, I feel like I'm, I'm losing my grip on it a little bit. And that's kind of the downside of having, having the big, big handle. It's not particularly slippery, but because there's no grooves or anything here that's adding to the kind of tactile feeling or the connection to it, uh, I do find myself holding it really tight. I fatigue quicker and I also feel the shock in my hand more than I would if I held it with a looser grip. From there, I can talk about this cross section right here, and more or less there isn't one. There's just two little nubs that stick out. It doesn't provide a lot of hand protection, and they're not so big that you could really, I think if I were to try to hit somebody with them, I would punch them with my fist before I would touch them with either of these two little uh, protrusions that come out. They're not particularly sharp. Um, you could get a finger above one if you want to hold it really high up on the grip. At the same time, uh, I don't find them to be particularly obstructive if I want to ride my hand up high, and I don't find them to be particularly useful from a defensive perspective. Before I move on to the blade, I do want to point out this leather sheath. Uh, it's riveted. It's relatively, I don't know, it feels like relatively thin leather, um, and I haven't really held it from a belt, but it it feels a little bit on the, the flimsy side. It's riveted all the way around, and it didn't necessarily hold it in uh, tight, <laughs> so you'd want to keep it on your belt, and it could fall out if you turn it over. But if you mounted it to a belt, it's unlikely to, to keel over and fall out if you, if you have it secured just with one area. It's probably going to follow your hip pretty well. But a katana, ideally, would, for its namesake, hold in, this, in the scabbard, and you would draw it and be able to cut in one motion. You can't really do that with that scabbard here. So I assume that's not a feature they were going for uh, with, with the katana. Now the blade, the pointy pointy stabby part. The blade uh, more or less has an unsharpened bracasso area, uh, kind of more towards the base. It's about two or three inches long. And then it's one flat piece of steel, or it was anyway, this one's now broken. But this one long flat piece of steel doesn't have any distal taper and it has very little profile taper, which you'll see from the dimensions down below. It has a fuller or a bohe that kind of runs the length. Uh, it's reasonably deep, but I don't imagine it offers a whole lot of weight savings and it's probably more of an aesthetic feature than anything else. It also wanders around a little bit. It meanders somewhat like it was kind of hand cut in. Uh, the lines on it all kind of wander around. They're not bad uh, for a handmade object at $300, but they're not, they're not great either. And the edge came not particularly sharp, sufficiently sharp, where if I really kind of leaned into things, it cut through things, but it wasn't really ever super sharp, so I, I can't say that it ever really popped things apart when I went to cut. Uh, it had a profile, though, that was capable of being sharpened and delivering better performance than what it got to see in my hands now that it is, now that it is diminished. Uh, the spine was just pretty much flat. It didn't have any rounding or interesting bits. And the tip just kind of wandered over rather than having like a Japanese-influenced gisaki or something like that. It looks a little bit more like, like a big knife. And it's made a little bit more like a big knife. Anyway, uh, polish on it is more of a satin -y kind of finish. I saw a lot of tool marks in it. I don't know if that was because it was used or not. But conceivably, if it got scratched or something like that, this is something that a person could, you know, buff or take a... Uh, sandpaper too, or a steel wool or something like that and not really have it matter too much. And I'd imagine most people that are using this are not buying it as an object of beauty, but want something to have fun with or something to rely on for a camp tool or something to rely on in the end of days. And in that case, uh, a polish that you're not worried about, I think is, is more a benefit than anything else. All right, now I'll talk briefly about moving the sword around. And I can't tell you how it feels to move like a katana because I didn't try because it's not one apart from the namesake, right? Uh, so I didn't try drawing and sheathing and doing kata and the like with it. But in terms of moving it and swinging it, it is very substantial. It's three pounds, 10 ounces, so more than three and a half pounds in terms of weight, which isn't out of the ballpark range for a katana. 
um, or a sword in general, but usually three and a half pound swords have longer blades and are bigger, even if they are katana. And so this is just something that you feel the weight of all the time. And I think you're intended to. It's overbuilt to be very durable. It's just worth noting that it doesn't feel, despite its kind of smaller stature, usually smaller but heavier swords, because all that mass is kind of packed a little bit closer together, they move around a little bit more nimble than you might expect them to. This isn't the case here. I, at no point did it feel nimble, like I had an abundance of tip control, uh, like it was easy to start or stop or control or get where I needed to go. At the same time, it felt like it had a lot of mass and would be very authoritative in the cut. So that's, that's the impression that I had. Two hands makes it easier to move, but just at no point was it fun or comfortable. Now, the, the thing is, I'm comparing it to swords that are intended for different purposes. As an overbuilt kind of zombie chopper, end of days sword, I would still say it's cumbersome. Because as I think of other swords that have kind of had that theory behind them, uh, zombie tools happens to be one, and they are overbuilt and heavy, but I would say do a little bit more with balance and dynamics than, than this sword achieves. And those are also worth noting that they're more expensive. The zombie tool, Zakazashi, is one that I tested some time ago. It wasn't dissimilar to this one in terms of size, uh, but it certainly felt a lot better in terms of moving it around and whatnot. This, uh, if you have very slow moving enemies in the end of days, you might be able to do something. But if, if they're quick and moving around you, this, this one is just, it's going to fatigue you really quickly and you don't feel particularly agile or accurate when moving it. At least I didn't. Now, the other bit that I think is, is worth noting here is how does it actually cut? So in cutting pool noodles, it kind of bats them around. It's not sharp enough and I have to really swing hard to get it to cut through a pool noodle. And then I, I can kind of get it to, but I wouldn't say it's ever particularly graceful. Uh, bottles, if it's really soft plastic and cuts through them, but harder plastics, it kind of bats around. Uh, I would say that it does cut bottles, just not, not gracefully. Uh, on harder targets though, like logs and lumber, I, I brought it out to some kind of construction materials, some 2x2s, two uh, and it just smashes them apart. It cuts pretty deeply into them, and it also has a lot of impact and just smashes things apart. It breaks the wood, and then like it takes the bottom part of the wood and breaks it other places too. There's just a lot of impact. It's as much a percussive weapon as it is a slashing or cutting weapon. So, cutting-wise, it certainly has a lot of impact. The downside is you kind of feel it. So if I'm swinging with two hands, as I mentioned when I talked about the handle, I feel some shock in my lower hand and I don't feel it if I swing hard with one hand. So I started to favor kind of throwing it out with one hand or loosening my grip on the, on the second hand because there was a little bit of vibration that came in on my second hand when I was really impacting targets. Uh, but it, it, it handles things well. Uh, now, if I do that and I smash it into large objects, overall, it's, it is generally quite durable. So I, I smash it into lumber. Um, and then I eventually brought it over to a, a metal container. I smashed it into like a, a metal old appliance. It, it held up to that, didn't damage the edge a whole lot. When I threw it at a tree, that's when I started to see some damage, some bending. I started to see the scales crack a little bit and it come apart. And then later when I went to the Tree of Woe, after throwing it at a tree several times, I brought it to the Tree of Woe, which has broken swords, but I slapped it on the side of the tree and it, it really started to take a set very easily. Now, worth noting that I really bent it, it bends over a certain amount, and then I can flex it back, uh, basically with my knee or with the tree by slapping it on the tree, and it springs kind of, well, it doesn't spring anywhere, but it bends back into form and bends back straight. So this suggests to me a, a pretty significant problem. And the first major one that we've really accomplished or encountered on the review here, and that is that it's it's too soft. And this has unfortunately been something that I've, I've heard has happened with other scorpion swords is that they're too soft. Ideally, a through hardened sword like this, as thick as this is, uh, if I slap it on the side of a tree, would spring back. And so that didn't happen here. That's what I like to see in swords like this, where you can kind of hit them and they spring back into true. And I think that's what you'd want in the, the end of days is a little bit better, better tempered or better heat treated or something a little bit more springy uh, than, than what this sword has. Uh, there was an opportunity to do it here. Unfortunately, it wasn't realized in the the bendable sword is just not ideal because in the end of days you might be batting shovels and baseball bats away from you and you might not always be able to get it just on the the edge side of things and if you don't then the sword is going to bend and it doesn't leave you with a, a very it even leaves you with an even less comfortable weapon anyway i straightened it out and brought it over to the croquet stick of doom which has been the ender of many swords so many strikes in the croquet stick of doom and it's not really taking much of any kind of damage. So I was expecting, since this is one soft, softer swords tend to last longer in the Croquet Stick of Doom, and that it was taking very, very little damage from striking the edge into the Croquet Stick of Doom. I thought it was going to last a long time.
as soon as I turned it over on the back and kind of gave it some a few strikes one-handed and, and not really with full authority, the blade broke. And so that was a surprise because uh, a lot of times through hardened blades are harder to break. Through hardened blades that are really soft and bendable take longer to break and they don't generally fall apart. They usually bend and you straighten them and eventually the metal fatigues. But this, I didn't bend it that many times. Uh, forward, backward, and straight in comparison to some other, you know, 1045 katana, a lot smaller pieces of metal that I've, I've done this to with softer metals, I guess I'd say. So I was really surprised that it broke quickly and it kind of gave me the impression that that's, again, a big miss. Not only did it not spring back into, into shape, but when pushed into to doing some of the abusive stuff that you may have seen these swords do in the past, it kind of failed at that too. On striking on the spine, which is admittedly a recipe to break the sword, I just, I, th I thought it would take a lot more hits to, to do. Now, it's, it's worth noting that I was hard on it and abused it before then. It's also worth noting that I had cut earlier into a katana, um, but at no point was the edge really damaged. I couldn't see damage on the edge that penetrated even a millimeter into the edge. So very little edge damage to happen, and very small, well, considering how hard I can strike, relatively soft strikes were happening along the spine and the sword failed. So, all right, sword friends, you've heard me talk about it. You've seen me move it around or at least try to, try to cut with it. You've seen high-res video and you've seen me push it to failure. And hopefully in that there's been enough information for you to make up your own mind about if it's worth your money or not. But I'm gonna try to answer that question myself. And the short answer is no, no, it's not. At $200, no, at $300, harder no. And the basic gist is it's not a sword that I vibe with. Subjective reasons, it just wasn't fun for me. And also very objective reasons in that I thought the sword was weak. Um, so at least weak for what it's supposed to be. It held up reasonably well. It's reasonably durable. But considering it's supposed to be supremely durable, I thought it failed in what it was suggesting it should be there. Now, it's worth noting as well that this is one scorpion sword, one sword from the Doomsday line, and perhaps newer versions than this sword have addressed some of the concerns or problems that I have that are making me say no here. But for this one sword, uh, for its time, for this for this particular piece, I would say no. Now, they're not vibing with this sword. Why don't you vibe with it? Well, it tries to break my grip and it's cumbersome. It's hard to generate speed. It's hard to stop and control. And I never really felt in great control of the weapon. It just wasn't fun to move around. And it's not to say that I don't like overbuilt swords at times. I kind of enjoyed the zombie tool Zakazashi. I've mentioned that a few times in this video, and it moved around a little bit more gracefully. It held up to the punishment as well quite a bit better. Now, it's $200 more. That's not an insignificant amount of money. Sometimes it's another one of these whole swords, but I would say it, it goes after what this sword is going for, but does it in a way that is useful. <laughs> and this sword uh, was just not fun to move around. So... That's the subjective side of things. Now, you could easily say, I like the big grip. I like the styling. I like the mass. And that's fine. You you can enjoy that kind of stuff. And I, I could say there's definitely swordsmen out there who, who are capable of moving more than I am and could well enjoy this size of sword. And if you happen to be one of them, then I would guess that you are also hoping to have durability commensurate with the extra weight and mass that you are moving around. And that's where I think this one also fails. Now, it bent easier than I think it should have. I think I've heard of scorpion swords having this issue in the past, so I don't know if it still is or isn't, but it shouldn't bend. The Zakazashi didn't bend. The katana that I was testing the same day didn't bend. Uh, spring steel should be able to spring back into shape, and I think that's the desired outcome. This has enough mass to, I think, be a little bit springier than it is. Now, you, again, might excuse it away and say, hey, um, Historic swords bent. This is an historic sword, so I don't think that argument is great. But you might say, uh, you know, if I strike it on the edge, it doesn't bend. And that was also the case for me. Uh, it took very little edge damage. If you're just striking on the edge, you're probably going to be fine. But if you're in the end of days, I don't see how that's a very likely outcome if you want a very durable, reliable friend that uh, is, is durable from every angle. And if you're defending against a baseball bat, you might not get the edge there. If you miss and hit a fence post, then you might end up bending the sword, and that's not great. But maybe you'll say those won't happen to me. In the end of days, I'll have supreme accuracy, and I'll only hit the sword with the edge, because that's what it's meant to do, and you suck, and that, you know, fine. Okay. Okay, then I would say it still broke sooner. And when I, I struck the edge, I, you know, threw it at trees, I was abusive to it, and it held up through all that, you know, kudos to the sword. Uh, and it took very little edge damage, so there wasn't a whole lot going on in terms of damage to the edge. When I turned it on the spine, it only took a few small whacks to break it in half. And by contrast, the $500 katana that I was testing the same day didn't. It took a lot more whacks to get that sword to break on the same croquet stake. So 
uh, I think given how durable this sword is supposed to be, how wide it is, how heavy it is, I was expecting it to last more or take harder strikes at least uh, to break this sword. Honestly, I was kind of thinking I would have to take this to like a chop saw and diminish the edge in a very meaningful way uh, before it would break, but it was kind of some, some ham, you know, some kind of limp-wristed strikes of the crow stake, croquet stake of doom that eventually got it to fail. No, it, it did fail after I got to the croquet stake and after I had started hitting the spine. For most swords, that's going to be a victory. Uh, for this one, though, I, was, I had a little higher expectations, and I would venture a guess that if you favor a really durable big sword like this, your expectations would be similar to mine. So it failed to meet them, and that's why I would also say no, because of the durability and performance side of things. Now, you're welcome to disagree. If you disagree, Scorpion Swords still sells swords that look like this. If you happen to like one, uh, they're going to be available or something similar at the link down below, or at least that's where you'll be able to find more information. But if there are other swords are like this, then I, I would struggle to recommend them. Um, they may well not be, though. This is an early version of a Scorpion Sword. Uh, Doomsday Line Katana. They make newer versions now. I don't think they sell this one anymore. And perhaps the issues that I've talked about in this video have been addressed in the newer versions. Hopefully they have, because they, they seem quite significant. Anyway, that is all I got. Special thanks to Sword from Vance for sending me this sword to move around. Despite the fact it wasn't fun to move, I did have fun moving it. It was fun to, to test and push to failure. Hopefully you found value in the video. That's all I've got. Cheers, and thanks for watching.